Okay, because the live stream will get going, so I'll... Um, do you, uh, Hi, oh, hello, can everyone hear me? I'm going to make Roger and David sit down now. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Tau Centre um, here at uh, Columbia Journalism School. Um, I was just speculating, we had a very, very overpacked um, event bright response to this, and I was speculating wildly about why we may not be seeing quite so many people. And uh, Jochai Benkler, our, our, our speaker, said, don't speculate, it's this sort of thing that spreads fake news, so I'll stop, <laughs> I'll stop speculating. Um, but it's a real thrill to host uh, Jocko Benkler and his new book, Network Pro Propaganda, Anton D. Craig Silverman, who is, um, it, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure you all do, uh, a, the media editor, or are you editor, are you editor at large? I never quite know. No, media editor. Media editor at BuzzFeed, <laughs> who... Um, in 2014, 15, did a tiny, well, not a tiny, but actually a pretty good research project for us called Lies, Damn Lies, and Viral Content. The findings that he started to uncover in that, he developed into a database, which developed into a series of really sensational stories about how the information environment was being manipulated uh, throughout the 2016 election. He is responsible for the term fake news, but he should be the only, wow. per maybe, <laughs> he should be the only person who is allowed to use it. Um, so we're here to, say, celebrate the book, but also to have a very, um, uh, I hope, granular and informed discussion about the findings, because I do think that uh, this book is really going to sort of redefine how people think about what happened during the 2016 election. Um, Jochai Benkler is probably uh, the world's leading thinker on, um, if you like, the sort of the new economics of networks. Uh, certainly my students uh, are subjected to uh, and are pleased to be made to read The Wealth of Networks, which is still to me one of the defining works of this era. Um, and just after the 2017 election, uh, Jochai and researchers um, at Harvard and uh, the Berkman Center, where Jochai is a uh, professor of entrepreneurial law, um, did some work on the far-right ecosystem of news um, and started to map for, I think, the first time what was emerging um, in American news that we hadn't really seen before. Um, and this book takes uh, his work a step further um, with his co-authors who are Robert Farris and... Hal Roberts. And Hal Roberts. Um, and what we're going to do is, uh, Jochai is going to talk us through the findings, which um, challenge a lot of uh, received wisdom on this. Uh, and then Craig and I will join him on stage to discuss the findings, and we really want you to participate uh, and um, have your own questions ready because there's an awful lot I've read the book it's just a fantastically rich work absolutely packed with interesting and fascinating insights um, and as Yoko himself said you know actually you really need time to kind of break it down and think about it so I'm, gr I'm so grateful he's here uh, to help us do that tonight and with no, with no more ado Yoko please come up thank you so much I have I'm, I'm uh, very mic'd up and actually quite loud if you can uh, is this too loud um, <clears throat> so thank you for that incredibly generous introduction uh, Emily and for being willing to come and talk and invite me here to talk and thank you schlepping uh, for schlepping and coming and really for doing some of the very very best data journalism there is in exposing these materials and would love to um, have debate about differences in perspectives uh, from what you found in your work and what we found in ours. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> yes or no? Where are we? So if there's a moment that captures the um, epistemic crisis 
of the moment. It's Pizzagate, it's the 20-something year old who walks into Comet Pizza in DC uh, with, a, uh, uh, with an assault rifle to investigate the belief Clinton, uh, 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 people from the Clinton Foundation uh, um, um, uh, campaign ran a pedophilia ring out of the bottom of the uh, pizza. To the point that in a YouGov poll in December 2016, 46% of Republicans said that they thought there was at least some truth around the fact that emails suggested that there was um, 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 uh, some truth to the story. By 2018 in August, 51% of Republicans said uh, uh, in a Quinnipiac poll that the press is the enemy of the people. 91% of Democrats said they're actually part of democracy. Uh, a fundamental difference. And as the election ended, a variety of theories began to emerge, thinking about what it was that had created this information disorder we were occupying. And the majority of these theories were largely technological, either commercial or political, whether it's uh, uh, Craig's work on fake news entrepreneurs abroad and then here in hyperpartisan uh, sites, uh, whether it's the Facebook algorithm and filter bubbles, whether it's echo chambers that people separate themselves, whether it's micro-targeting in Cambridge Analytica, whether it's more political in Russia or the alt-right. The fundamental frame through which most of the conversation happened was technology that is out of control washed over us and destroyed our ability to tell truth from fiction. My own team and a few others focused more on institutional points and critically on right-wing media, domestic right-wing media and its practices. And we then moved from that initial work to a broader scope and to ultimately this book with my co-authors, our research director at uh, the Berkman Klein Center, uh, Robert Farris, and the lead technical developer of Media Cloud, Hal Roberts, uh, who built the system through which we did most of the data collection and analysis. Essentially, we look at four million US national political stories, ranging from the beginning of the presidential period, the election period in April 2015, until the one year anniversary of the Trump administration. We look at how they linked to each other, they, we look at their text, we look at how they were tweeted, we look at how much they were Facebook shared, we have a lot less Facebook data. Um, we use mixed method, methods in case studies, we also use TV archives, um, we do network analysis, we do text analysis, we do uh, data guided case studies, and we do a basic historical political economy of how it emerged. And the effort to bring all of these together to be able to understand what happened. The fundamental image is this. We use two kinds of maps. Link-based map, which are like these. The nodes are media outlets. The links are descriptions of when a story from media source one links to another. That creates a link between the two. The link maps are maps of the supply of news and the authority that producers of media give each other by linking. I read you, I linked to you, I relied on you, you're my authority. It's a shape of authority and uh, 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 connection between producers. What we see very clearly when we zoom into the top 100 is that traditional media, professional media continue to actually be very, very important. The death of professional journalism is overstated uh, to say the least. The second thing we see is that there's almost no center left. And the third is that the right creates an insular system anchored in Breitbart versus Fox. There is no symmetric polarization. Even on the supply side, before you touch a Facebook algorithm, before you touch a Twitter uh, feed, just what people link to each other. There is a right and there is a rest, all the way from the journal to Mother Jones, all anchored around traditional professional media. When we look at 2017, what happens is the same, but more pronounced, with Fox reasserting its position relative to Breitbart even online by becoming more right-wing. How do we know that it's becoming more right-wing? It's the reason that this is farther away from the center is because the center, which has actually become more prominent relative to during the election, is no longer linking even to Fox News, and neither is the center right. They've focused their ability, they've revived themselves by producing stuff that even the center right and the center is not linking to. 
When we shift from the production side to the attention, to the demand side, by looking at Twitter networks, we see parallel and almost identical patterns, more pronounced, a little more polarization on the left than we saw in terms of authority. The center left has a lot more authority as among links. Attention is slightly more polarized symmetrically, but only slightly. We see Breitbart much larger during the election, and we see a, a, a much clearer separation. When we look at Facebook, it's the same thing, and this is in some sense a shocking image when we came out with this first, was just how prominent Breitbart was on Facebook. As Bannon said, Facebook is what made us uh, possible. When we look at Twitter on 2017, the separation, it's literally uh, escape velocity. They're just completely separate. And what you get here uh, on the right is not only that Fox News emerges again as more important, but Gateway Pundit and Truth Feed and True Pundit and Infowars, all of which make Breitbart seem like the gray lady, become that much more uh, uh, prominent. So we have a distinct radicalization and further separation when we measure by attention. A different way of looking and getting a feel for what's going on, this is the same data presented differently, so I'll go through it relatively quickly. Again, this is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, this is uh, during the election. This is links, tweets, Facebook shares. Critically, in terms of attention, there is no center right. It's completely collapsed. It doesn't exist. What you see on the right is that the more exclusively right wing you are, the more attention you get. Whereas when you move from the center right to the left, it's a much more normal distribution of attention anchored on the center. And this is true across all three measures, supply and demand. When we compare to 2017, the most surprising thing for us was that uh, the gray is, seven, is uh, 17. Each bin is how left and how right it is. Um, what you see is that those that were most prominent on the left actually decline in attention in 2017, and the increases happen in the center. On the right, you also see a decline here of Breitbart losing and Fox gaining. But interestingly, again, just like your story yesterday on Facebook and, and declines on left and the right, Craig, um, supply and demand and Facebook see this big drop. So some of this may be the Facebook algorithm, but some of it may simply be attention in the entire network growing to Fox News. On Twitter, there's not so much of a, of a loss because as we saw, Gateway Pundit, Truth Feed, True Pundit, are all succeeding. So new crazy is replacing the space uh, of Breitbart. But this is very interesting, that the left is moving to the center, whereas the right is becoming more insular and more right-wing, even in the Trump presidency. The basic model, it's not only that they don't link and don't tweet, they operate on different models. The rest of the media ecosystem in the right-rest distinction operates essentially on the model that began developing when this institution was founded and reached its height in the mid-century, in the mid-20th century and since then, of professional journalism. With internal competing uh, uh, incentives that we all know between trying to get the sensational headline, trying to get the, 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 the eyeballs, but at the same time trying to be professional, being uh, sites, uh, uh, media outlets uh, competing with each other on being first, but also on being correct, criticizing each other for failing to be correct. Audiences similarly are looking for identity confirming narratives, but they don't see them. They see media that instead separates opinion from news, sometimes give them news, new good news, sometimes give them bad news, have moderate trust. And politicians similarly are constrained by uh, the fact that they're looking for attention to sell identity confirming uh, views to the public, but they're constrained by the fact that their public is paying attention to media that are constrained by institutions of truth seeking. What's happened instead in the right wing is what we call the propaganda feedback loop. Essentially, media outlets compete with each other purely on stoking identity confirmation. What that means as a practical matter is that when a news medium, uh, when a particular outlet tries to serve this audience with a somewhat or facts-based statement on a story or not, it simply gets ignored or it gets attacked. So we have this brief period where we describe during uh, the primary when Breitbart is still the pure Trump party outlet 
And Fox News is trying to still maintain somewhere in between because they don't know who's going to win. And they lose attention and they essentially drift in the attention network towards the center because they're under attack. Politicians similarly, if they find themselves trying to press on the brakes, this is the moment at which we think of it as, a, as an act of bravery. When John McCain says to a woman who says that Obama is an Arab, actually, no. That we consider, we, we read about that when he dies as an act of courage because in this system you lose and you get attacked. So we see it during the primaries throughout ranging from uh, Breitbart attacking uh, 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 Fox for uh, Fox News colluded with Rubio to give amnesty to illegal aliens. You see the structure of the propaganda. The politician you're against, the media are, uh, uh, you're not interested in, and the immigration topic that you want to push all through together. And of course, Infowars does one up and, and paints uh, Jeb Bush as relying on Nazis. Um, the critical difference is how that network structure does or does not contain the propagation of disinformation. So the closest match study we have is there was a lawsuit that alleged that Donald Trump had raped a 13-year-old at a party run by Jeffrey Epstein. And there were stories that Bill Clinton, and later on they brought Hillary on the island too, um, uh, flew on the Lolita Express to Pedophilia Island. These were very closely matched in time, in structure, and when we look at the purely Facebook bullshit clickbait sites uh, that we would associate with fake news in the original sense, in fact, the supply is the same. This is, they're writing only about the Trump Jane Doe story a lot. These guys are writing about Clinton pedophilia a lot. These are some of the places that are only visible on Facebook and have practically no presence on Twitter and the open web. The critical difference between the sites is not the supply and demand at the real edges, but it's over here. When we compare coverage of the Trump Jane Doe story to the Clinton pedophilia story in the most late stuff, it's only on the right that we have Clinton pedophilia stories vastly overshadowing anything we see here. When we're looking at most tweeted, similarly, the right here at the top, the most tweeted sites, is what's propagating it. So the critical point is it's not that people on the left don't want to hear stuff that makes them hate Trump. And it's not that there aren't clickbait, Facebook clickbait entrepreneurs trying to make money from selling it to them. But they're embedded in different in networks with different institutional forms that check the worst of the frameworks. So again, if you look at the specific stories, the HuffPo story right immediately that says why we should not ignore these allegations gets a million and a quarter Facebook shares. It's the most Facebook uh, shared story on this particular topic that there is. There's plenty of demand. But in no time at all, Jezebel and then The Guardian and then The Daily Beast come up with various debunking that finds who the people are who manufactured this lawsuit. And after that, the story dies. The Clinton pedophilia story, by contrast, uh, starts with Fox News and Malia Zimmerman coming up with a FOIA request to get new records so that there's news in restating an old story from Gawker that sends Bill Clinton incorrectly and falsely uh, to so-called pedophilia island. It gets repeated throughout uh, the right-wing media ecosystem. Uh, but more importantly, it shows up in a long segment on Brett Beyer. Gingrich shows up on Hannity and talks about it, shows up again on Greta Van Susteren and talks about it. And it becomes something that people, both leading pundit figures and Fox News, keep repeating for the next five or six months in various variations such that it's not surprising that at the end of the story, 46% of Trump voters think there's got to be something there. It's, they're not getting it from the edges. They're not getting it from the Sputnik reporter who found one little piece here, one little thing. They're getting it here. This is what they're watching. In fact, this is really what they're watching because when we look at the survey data, we see very clearly that Fox News uh, is the primary source of uh, presidential news for Republicans. Facebook is much lower. Uh, the population that, it, that buys and repeats this false news is relatively old with relatively little social media usage. It, consistently, the more social media and Facebook use there are, the less Trump support you will see across populations. There's increasingly good work uh, among some economists showing that e polarization, or generally over time, has been associated with age groups and demographics with less internet access. This is the story as opposed to the much greater distribution of 
attention of Democrats. The other thing is trust. This is a little older, 2014 data. But if you look at consistently liberals and who they trust the most, it's NPR, PBS, BBC, and the New York Times. The equivalently conservative people, it's Fox News, Hannity, Limbaugh, and Glenn Beck. It's very simple. It, unless you're willing to say that PBS, the BBC, and the New York Times are equivalent to Hannity, Limbaugh, and Beck in terms of reliability, it's this that you need to explain, not anything else. And this is pure radio and television. Um, and interestingly, mostly liberal and mixed are all basically watching the same thing as the most trusted media outlets. MSNBC is here, but it's barely more trusted than not uh, uh, by people. So now I'll just sort of tease a few things because I want to get us into the conversation. I'll go a little quickly. I'm happy in the questions. If people want to focus on anything specific, I'm happy to go back to it. One of the things we do in the book that we didn't do in an earlier study that I came presented here is we really focus heavily on Fox News propaganda in the first year of the Trump presidency. So the big frame of the deep state gets completely rewritten in early 2017. When you look from 2012 to 2017, it's used very little and it's used primarily about Egypt and Turkey and Turkish. This is a word vector that describes the stories. Beginning in December of, 20, of, of, of 2016, it becomes about Trump and undermining him and Hannity and Fox. It's completely reframed from a pox on both your parties and the national security state, we the liberals and the civil libertarians hate you, to Obama holdovers in the national security and law enforcement are trying to, the, the, to drop Trump. The big jump here is when when Fox News starts, it exists before that. Glenn Greenwald is still using it to some extent in January in the old way. Uh, Breitbart brings it a little bit up here, but it's not seen. But all these peaks, Flynn fired, Comey fired, Mueller appointed, Mueller looking into obstruction, the Trump Tower meeting. You see that the, that the peaks in television, both on Fox and Fox Business, correlating to what we see here with Google Trends searches and with uh, links and with tweets are heavily focused on creating a campaign uh, to protect uh, Trump. The Seth Rich conspiracy in which the idea is it's not the Russians who stole the emails from the DNC, it's a DNC staffer who was murdered, starts to be pushed by all sorts of weird players and, and alt-right uh, uh, Twitter handles here. Gets a little bit of a bump when WikiLeaks offers a, 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 a prize for whoever finds information. But all this first period is completely dwarfed by this later event when in November, as more and more Manafort gets arrested, Flynn uh, 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 pleads uh, guilty, what you get instead is morning, noon, and night from Fox and Friends in the morning through Lou Dobbs in the afternoon to Hannity in the evening. You see, uh, uh, you, oops, we'll come to you. Uh, you see spikes in coverage for over a month, morning, noon, and night about this story about Uranium One and how uh, Russia got 20% of the US nuke industry under Obama scandal. The basic frame change that happens here on T is you start with Clinton kickback, which is not what, in fact, the documents uh, reflected. That's the real Russia story. It's not really about Trump Russia. And who are, the, who are the bad guys? These are the bad guys who, in 2009, didn't tell the American people that the Clintons had gotten a kickback and hid it for them. Because the point is to get rid of them. And all these place, people who are telling you that that's not true, they're just hiding the scandal. As he puts it there so truthfully, we've been telling you for years Journalism is dead. And in fact, they have been telling it for years. This is, by the way, the most YouTube watched uh, uh, story on YouTube at this period, too. Essentially, when you look at the general social survey and people losing confidence or hardly having any confidence in journalism, you see this inflection point on the right co coinciding with Fox News. You see another inflection point that happens to both Democrats and Republicans. It would be lovely if it weren't for Democrats because that's when Rush Limbaugh launches. But there's no question that Rush Limbaugh, as he talks about the four corners of deceit, including journalism, government, science, and academia, and Hannity repeatedly attacking, create a population of people who are disoriented, 
who cannot turn to any other place to understand what's going on. And this is part of a decades-long disorientation campaign that really needs to be anchored in 1988. So there's a beautiful piece uh, 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 by, by Boxer against Count Shapiro that really shows that most of the polarization happens in populations whose primary media is TV and radio and not the internet. That's what we need to essentially explain. I'll quickly just wave my arms on this, but fundamentally it's important to understand by 93, the National Review is already calling Rush Limbaugh the leader of the opposition. Ronald Reagan is writing him a letter saying, I'm so thrilled you are the one who's leading the opposition. 94, he gets elected an honorary member of the class of 94 of freshmen. By 96, uh, the Pew study talks about Rush Limbaugh as having more audience than all the business magazines put together. And roughly the same number of people who today say they watch Fox News and, and uh, talk radio are already either watching, listening to talk radio or watching Christian broadcasting. So you already have that audience there. And the critical difference between the post-war period and uh, what happens in 1998 is not that there's no right-wing media, but they, they become incredibly lucrative. And obviously here I'm not going to go into the full political economy, but the basic story is that a series of technological changes in UHF and VHF, in cable, in uh, satellite retransmission, in AM and the transition to FM, together with deregulation of some of the public interest obligations and elimination of the fairness doctrine, elimination of group ownership rules on radio, of deregulation of cable and deregulation of satellite, allow the creation of a new business model that's focused not on programming to the center and dividing between the number of channels, but on giving a small segment something that no one else will give it. That's where the propaganda feedback loop comes from because the first mover, which was the right, we were able to give people that started that model. At which point, by the time that Breitbart launches in 2007, the target audience has already been exposed to Limbaugh for 20 years, to Fox for 10 years. It would be suicide to try to do anything else. When BuzzFeed or HuffPo are launched in 2005, 2006, MSNBC hasn't even changed its strategy and Air America is barely a year old and not long for this world. So let me end. This, by the way, is a similar map from 2012 that we have to already show you that this already exists, although it's noisy and not with a huge amount of data. Let me leave you with a minute and a half or two on the fact that it can't all be Fox News because they only serve somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of the population. And to understand in this building better than anywhere else, the particular class of failures of traditional professional journalism in the teeth of such an asymmetric propaganda system as the one we currently occupy. So this is Gallup poll, what is most closely associated to you with Trump or Clinton before the Podesta email hack? Uh, and it's email, scandal, lie. That's what people are thinking. That doesn't come just from the right wing. This is uh, every reference to email throughout the entire eight, uh, uh, 18 months, broken down by left, center, left, center, and center, right. And what you see here again and again is that except for here with the DNC dump and here with the Podesta dump, everything else is just civil servants doing what they're supposed to do, State Department people clearing emails, FBI agents uh, uh, making statements, Inspector General making statements, and journalists doing what they're supposed to do, which is reporting on it. But essentially what you get is a steady stream of association of Clinton, with email and scandal throughout this system in the teeth of then occasional efforts by various players to interject more emails either through leaking or through FOIA requests. Uh, so that's critical and we can talk more about why I think this helps explain why it's not the Russians who made the difference. Just notice one thing, this peak, the Comey announcement of reopening the investigation dominates everything just before the election. So if there's one thing you can say changed, it's this. Uh, the other thing that's more generally is 
when we look at all of the sentences by the top 15 mainstream media organizations, clearly what you see, Clinton is email and foundation, a little bit of Benghazi, nothing else in terms of substance. Trump, it's immigration and jobs. So you see Clinton scandals versus issues, Trump's issues versus scandals. All this coverage is negative on both of them. But critically, when you think of objectivity as neutrality, in the face of a highly asymmetric propaganda system, you end up with complicity. You end up with confirming, affirming, and propagating the propaganda. And I think the practice now is improving somewhat with, an, with leaning forward, with saying that things are false, with deciding what to show and what not to show. But in the election, this is a major failure mode of professional journalism, of not shifting the frame of objectivity from your to, verifiable, to, 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 to uh, uh, verifiability. To me, the, over, the fundamental point is that technology interacts with political uh, and cultural institutions in ways that shape uh, 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 the way things work. The usual suspect, the Facebook algorithm, the Russians, the, the, the fake news entrepreneurs do operate, but they only operate within this system and through this system and getting amplified by it. Uh, and we should care about the new developments, and we should plan for 10, 15 years from now. But we can't cons misdiagnose what's happening to us today and imagine that technocratic solutions like better fact-checking on Facebook are going to solve something that's fundamentally a 40-year process of uh, institutions. So it's not the Russians, and it's not the algorithm. It's Fox News. It's Russ Limbaugh. It's the right-wing media ecosystem. And the first thing we need to do is recognize that that is what is currently happening to us. And that's what we immediately need to address. Looking forward to having a conversation about it. Can I have a seat? So, wow, that was quite, that was a tour de force. Um, so, Craig, you've been looking at. Uh, if you like the other end of this, which is the fake news factories, the Russian trolls, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. what are your responses to the idea that this is more of a systemic mainstream amplification problem than it is? I, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think that the reason that the people who were, one, if we take the purely fake stuff, they were targeting into existing audiences. So this is the structure, this is the foundation, that if they were smart about it, they realized this, this was a somewhat closed cycle that they could get into and earn money from that. Um, and you know, one of the most famous sort of pure fake news guys, uh, Justin Kohler, talked about that, how he realized, well, he tried to do left-leaning stuff, he tried to do right-leaning stuff, the right-leaning stuff worked better. And one of the things that I think is important that you emphasize in the book is it's not, it's not an intelligence thing, it's not a gullibility thing, it's about an infrastructure that has been built and that is separated from more kind of reporting-based and fact-based journalism where you have a fertile environment for this kind of stuff to get out there. The corrective measures of you know, having to issue corrections, of facing shame from these kinds of things, they aren't as prominent in that other universe. And so, so I do think they're just completely connected. And then you also have not just, if you set aside the fake stuff and you sort of this realm that we've started calling hyper-partisan, for people who were purely financially motivated and didn't really care about politics, again, if you are a business person, that closed universe there where you can get stuff in and they're very engaged and they're in opposition to the more mainstream and liberal stuff, then that's just, that's a better market for you. So I, I think they're just 100% connected and integrated, yeah. And Yoko, you said several times, you know, particularly in this building, journalism school, um, these are the things we need to pay attention to. And it, 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 there's, there's a kind of an interesting, I've been in several rooms, and I'm sure that both of you have as well, where we endlessly discuss um, fake news, information integrity, what journalism's role in all of that is. Um, and some of the findings are very, or, or rather some of the suggestions are very divergent, like journalists just shouldn't cover certain stories. It's what sort of Dana Boyd calls strategic silence, etc. Um, that's very hard. That's a hard message. I mean, obviously, you know, and does it make it does it make a difference um, the way that journalists cover stories? Because it seems from your 
mapping of this that actually there is a completely self-contained ecosystem which actually is pretty impervious and is, it, 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 actual journalism doesn't have much of a, an effect on it. So what, what can we do? So, so um, what's critically important about the numbers I describe is that the universe of people who can get up in the morning and have breakfast with Fox and Friends and commute back and forth from work with talk radio and have lunch with Rush Limbaugh and spend the evening with, with Tucker Carlson and Hannity and Ingram um, is, act is large but limited. So there are no specific numbers, but I'd say based on the range of plausible numbers, a bare minimum of 20, a maximum of a third, there are still on the order of 20-ish percent of people who will more or less reliably vote Republican who aren't all there. So to me, the critical role of journalism is to make sure that those people that still do pay attention to professional journalists don't become confused, that they can tell the difference. They watch some of this and some of this, but they can tell the difference. And that's an incredibly important population not to lose. Uh, how you do it is a whole new question that I don't think we know, uh, but at the moment at least, um, uh, it means what we're seeing more is, is clear statements of here's what we've done, here's our method, here's our journalists, here we're... Uh, older studies of us that were not on this broad of a national state, when we looked at specific controversies that were more technology politics specific, I was actually surprised to see how important even online uh, mainstream or traditional professional media were because that's not, that's not what we saw in when we were looking at more specific technical issues. We saw a lot more diversity and, and, and smaller. And this is fairly consistent and, and in that regard it's good news for journalism. It still plays, for 70% of Americans it still plays an absolutely critical role uh, and that's enough to make the difference. So Craig, you study and report on the whole news ecosystem uh, and changes that are made within um, platforms and, uh, you know, uh, putting the same question to you in a slightly different way, which is, you know, do you see anything in your work which gives us um, cause to be hopeful uh, that, you know, we can actually restore a kind of, because it seems to say we're sort of, asking whether or not we can restore a kind of, we can move the Overton window, or we can store a kind of a, a norm setting which is more in the center. Um, that's not actually totally consistent with, for instance, platform policies, which is to remain completely sort of agnostic and neutral about mm -hmm. what kind of um, journalism or what kind of content they propagate. Yeah, and I think uh, when it comes to platforms specifically right now, there's a pretty good, movement happening among some conservatives to really kind of work the refs a little bit on the platforms and say you're you're censoring conservatives to try and make sure that it it you know that they perhaps don't suffer the fate that some of the others seem to be and i mean overall like just about everybody is down if we're talking facebook um so things are changing for everybody um but okay so what am i optimistic about um I, I, I was going to joke and say I'm nothing, but I, I actually have some optimism about some things. I mean, as much as uh, you know, Trump has has capitalized, and the book lays out very well the way um, he has used things like immigration, and other things, to set an agenda, and to pull people to that agenda. And not only the the right sphere that he's a part of, um, and really in concert with Breitbart or Leon, but also to force mainstream and left attention onto the things that he wants to talk about that solidifies his base. But at the same time, as he's now taken over, I think you know we've seen things like a, a flowing of new revenue and also audiences to a lot of center and center left kinds of reporting. So you know, increase in subscribers to New York Times, increase in subscribers to Washington Post. Um, you know, we've seen this resurgence of, for example, The Guardian. I mean, The Guardian a year or two ago was you know was seen as like oh you know they're in they're in really bad shape and now the guardian is i think in better shape than it's been in a very long time and so those are all it's it's good to see those you know quality institutions that are seeing a stronger financial footing um, the, the one of the things and i don't know the answer to this but it's something actually i was discussing with somebody today is you know fox's audience for example is an aging audience right 
And so I wonder, and these are people who've been in that infrastructure as Yokai sent for like, you know, for 20 years, 30 years in some cases. Do people age out of this? Like, do, do we get to a point actually where a younger generation that is growing up with a different media ecosystem, ignoring kind of right and left, but does that actually change as the audience for cable news ages out? And what are, we, what are we left with there? Like, that's one of the questions for me. I don't know the answer to that, but I think there's a piece of this that is age and demographics as much as there's stuff about technology and ecosystem as well. So this is actually several different things. First of all, our data, and I didn't present it here, but our data is completely consistent with your findings about everybody going down on both sides, and we actually compare on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, so, so um, our data is completely consistent with what your reporting has been uh, showing for sure. Um, the point about the aging audience is an interesting one. Uh, but my sense is that essentially what you're getting here is because the right wing ecosystem online has had to deal with this older model, it's essentially replicating and extending it to a younger generation. So it's not that I don't think that Facebook will ever be the, well, it might not be because actually younger people aren't spending that much time. Uh, but um, I, I do think that the online side of things matters for younger people. But given that they've already, they, they had to step into the propaganda feedback loop in order to get audience, you had a short number of years actually, uh, say 2002 to 2008-ish, where right-wing blogosphere and left-wing blogosphere were much more similar, much more linky, much more talking to each other. Not a lot, one in six links, but some. And then it just goes all, uh, all the way. So, so I worry, or not I worry, I predict that what will happen is that those who grow up and are raised in right-wing families will use different media, but still within the same dynamic. And that's a sad story. And there was a, uh, we were discussing this earlier, but there was a report out um, at the end of last week by data and, our friends at Data and Society, which looked at something called an alternative influence network, which is the younger... Um, far-right uh, YouTubers who, again, have a similar sort of self-referential and reinforcing circles, uh, which creates, um, uh, Rebecca Lewis, who was the, the researcher who conducted the, the work, said this sort of creates a, a completely alternative kind of ecosystem, um, which actually looks very like the one that you, you drew up here for old media. Um, and I guess that, you know, again, sort of... it. The question is, if we want to disrupt this, or if, it, you know, if we want to, move, to, to resettle things, it's very striking, Yoko, that you, you, you talked about this, and, and, it, and it's clear in the book, you know, that there was a moment in the 80s when the Fairness Doctrine disappeared, um, where all of this sort of became, if you like, kind of a, a, a sort of extreme version of um, what had been a pretty kind of passive, central... Uh, broadcasting ecosystem. Um, is it time to re-regulate uh, the public sphere? Um, or is that, has that game gone? So certainly the game would be completely different than it would have been had we not had it to begin with because given the asymmetry it's impossible to understand this now except in political terms. Uh, so I think that makes it very difficult. The other thing is anybody who's living in the age of Trump needs to understand that any appeal to regulation is also susceptible to capture by fascist governments even in what are places that are currently democracies. So we have to be very cautious about what we wish for. Uh, yes, in some sense, I could imagine liking that Alex Jones is kicked off um, um, uh, Facebook and Apple, um, but what other, what, what other sources of influence will Apple and Facebook respond to in which countries and removing whom? So coming up with some form of decent structure to contain the worst provide some framework for more plausible reporting would be good. 
creating a model that perhaps uses the, the state as a background threat, but not immediately in it, and create something that's much more based on some of the platforms and some of the civil society organizations, uh, I'm more comfortable with, given the risk that more and more countries will be flipping towards majoritarian authoritarianism or just plain authoritarianism and use these models to lean on the platforms to become censorship platforms. Great question. Uh, well, okay, so two things. The first, I was going to say, so my wish, you know, I would hate for people to think that this conversation is about how do we get rid of the right-wing media? You know, like that's not, that's not, at least for me, that's, you know, that's not the point. In fact, I think one of the best things we could do is actually cultivate um, really good, strong quality conservative media that is reporting based and isn't so commentary driven, and, but is actually, you know, has the same kind of um, corrective functions as sort of more the, the center media and mainstream media. Um, and I think that would be something that would be a very positive development. And so for me, when I see things like um, the Weekly Standard becoming part of the fact checking program at Pointer, I see that as a really good development. And when they fact check a Think Progress headline that is really misleading and people lose their minds, like, you know, that's, to me, that was a misleading headline and they should have fact checked it. So I think people have to be open to that and encourage that and cultivate more of that kind of reporting based reporting. And, and yes, I think, you know, the conservatives have had a fair gripe that the media has been more left leaning and getting those voices in there. I think that's one really productive way of doing it. On the second point of be careful what you wish for in terms of regulation, I mean, this is, this is a huge thing. I, I sort of like you, I kind of like the threat of regulation more than I like regulation of sort of saying, you know, you need to figure this out and you need to manage your platform and you need to actually enforce the rules that you say you have because that was the biggest problem for a long time on these platforms is they said they had policies but they got so big they did not build the infrastructure to actually enforce their policies consistently and fairly and so when they started doing it, people were freaking out because they hadn't been doing it for so long. Um, so we are already seeing in countries around the world, there was a very bad law passed in Malaysia, mm -hmm. there's a very bad law in Belarus, there's a very bad law in Kenya, the Malaysian one's trying to be repealed but the opposition is blocking it, there's a law that's probably going to come in in Singapore next year. So we could see absolutely the use of fake news as a threat as a crackdown and the silencing of media and that, that would be a terrible outcome of all of this. I mean, I, as a Brit, I was watching um, Jeremy Corbyn um, ad ad address the uh, Labour Party conference today, and he said, um, we stand with and support journalists in places like Myanmar. However, in Britain, well, however, however oh, Great, in, yeah. Bri in Britain, press freedom can too often mean the spreading of lies and half-truths. Um, and then he went on to say, you know, kind of really, we should be using the alternative um, channels for direct communication with uh, our audiences. We should be using social media. You know, we should have a, have a Twitter stream that wakes everybody up at six in the morning with a series of um, splenetic tweets. He didn't say that, but I was just imagining that's what may happen. Um, and it, it it was kind of that's. So it feels to me that this is a this is also a troubling thing which is happening, which is kind of politicians on the left and the right are using some of what we've seen over the past two or three years to say ignore journalism um, you know to, to use if you like the sort of the partisan um, you know the issue of fake news uh, to say sort of talk past uh, journalists don't kind of pay attention to them and it's a, a rhetoric that obviously we're very familiar with from the president but do we should we feel you know I feel deeply uncomfortable about that and again, as journalists or as academics, what, what are the things that we can do? And I hate the phrase restoring trust because it raises so many questions. But what can we do to stop, if you like, a sort of this slide towards authoritarianism, perhaps even on both sides of the political spectrum? That's a big question. So um, Let me mildly push back on one thing that Craig, you just sort of... Be more aggressive. Don't be mild. No, be strong. Be a massive pushback. Um, you, can, you can wrestle with him. Mild. Um, you stated as fact that the right has something about the mainstream media being left. I think that's false. 
I think when you go off kilter, I've spent too much of my time in the last 20 years as I was imagining the network public sphere and the way in which it checks mainstream media uh, to buy that story. Traditional professional media are not left. In a universe in which the right has been insanely radicalized, where Darwinism is no longer, uh, uh, and evolutionary biology is no longer acceptable, uh, to be centrist, more or less norms constrained when you're at work, more or less believing that you can separate what's your work to actually do investigation, and is left. But that's not left. And there's enough that comes out of that that actually real left can criticize and has criticized for decades about media ownership and the conservative bias of media based on uh, advertising. I mean, uh, this is literature I, I, I lived and where's Todd? He's gone. Um, um, <laughs> literature I lived, breathed, and grew up with. I, I'd be very cautious. What is happening and what's making it left is because the right wing has spun so far out of control, just telling it like it is gives people on the left identity confirmation so they start reading it more. Which is part of the reason that on the left you don't get a symmetric pattern because you get enough identity confirmation. So that's, I think, really important and it ties into, uh, into what I see as, as my contribution in this book to answering your question, which is the first, I think there are going, there have to be people in the Republican Party who look at the Trump Party and say, who stole my party? To me, this tells them one thing you need to do is you need to figure out how you make the Wall Street Journal the tomorrow's Fox, the thing that 40% that of Republican voter, voters read and watch should be the Wall Street Journal, not Fox. And, you've already, and I think that's absolutely critical for American democracy that something like that happens. Um, the second thing is to remind professional journalists that you still have an audience, even in the United States, that has a clear majority and can completely control the politics everywhere. And so by not focusing on the wrong place, on Facebook and platforms, but focusing on the right place of journalism and continuing to commit journalism consistently, recognizing that there is an audience there and being explicit about what you're doing, refusing to be treated as left, uh, being explicit about it to all your audiences, aiming to, for those audiences that are on the verge and understanding what they read and want and, 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 and think, those I think are all critical tasks for, for sustaining the idea of trust in professional journalism in a broad enough population to make the remainder too contained to be critical. Committing journalism consistently. Good point at which to come to the audience uh, for questions. I think we have a microphone. Do we have a microphone or is it my microphone? Is it, uh, it's my microphone. So if you, have, if you have a question, put your hands up because then we can keep you on the live stream. Um, there's a couple at the back there. Uh, sorry, can we, just keep, can we get your back so that you can, uh, we can hear you but the uh, live stream audience can't. And just, I know who you are but say who you are. Uh, uh, Ted Perlmutter, uh, I teach courses on Social Media and the Institute for the Study of Human Rights. And this is sort of a quasi-technical question, but also a political one in, in terms of just how, uh, how interesting your data is. I mean, I've, I've read a lot of the kind of the original SOPA internet studies based on Media Cloud, and I was quite struck by how good and granular they were. But in terms of, of this question, um, at a certain point, I think it's uh, Fox News basically decides that the Seth Rich conspiracy is too rich even for them, and they sort of break with it. But I think Hannity continues. Does your data sort of show, you know, sort of any effects of that break? Um, and if so, or if not, how do you reason that one? Let, uh, um, can you just repeat the stories that Fox finds too outlandish? Right. To I mean, repeat? At a certain point, they push the Seth Rich conspiracy. Um, and, you know, that he was the person involved. And then they say, no, this isn't true. But Hannity continues, despite the fact that his own network says, you know, uh, you know, we shouldn't be continuing with this. This is not factual. And I was just curious as to whether that produced a sort of a wider split 
And if so, did it sh show up in your data analysis? So no, it doesn't produce a wider split but the story keeps living in the nether region. So the story doesn't die. Oh, it's very easy to, dis, to misunderstand what I'm saying here as what happens only on the net doesn't matter, right? There's no question that Facebook and the net allow mobilized minorities to find each other, propagate stories. Some of it is wonderful and is the foundation of social movements that many of us would embrace. Others of it is terrible and would support social movements that some of us abhor. It's there, the affordances are there, they're real. And, and that was a lot of what we were, what, 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 what my team was, was writing about in those SOPA, PEPA, and net neutrality papers that you referenced, uh, was about edge groups finding ways to mobilize around the bottlenecks of mainstream media that wouldn't show what's happening. And that's true whether you're talking about the movement for black lives or whether you're talking about unite the right. In both of those cases, you see the capabilities growing and then the question is what your orientation is. But um, here what we focus on is what scales to the broader population level so that it moves voting at a large scale. And that's the critical move that I'm making here. And so what happens when Fox News won't touch it, which is actually quite rare. There's not a lot in our stories that they weren't willing to propagate, um, uh, even if it did mean that a month later they pulled it back like Seth Rich. Um, then it lives with Alex Jones, it lives with Breitbart, it lives with the Gateway Pundit, it lives with Zero Hedge, uh, but that's already within the framework, within the narrow uh, framework. And Fox itself actually, uh, if you'll excuse that I'm gonna brag about one thing. So this is from the immigration study. Uh, Fox itself even has, this is major news sites based on the language they use about immigration. Fox itself actually has a double strategy. It, some things that are unsafe even for Fox show up online in Fox Nation and Fox Insider, which is very tightly clustered with the Gateway Pundit uh, 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 and all those guys. Uh, and then some of the things uh, they, they, they do differently. So, um, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's pretty nasty. It can get pretty nasty uh, on some of the Fox properties. But the main question is, is growing up to the, to the larger level. Hi, Saul Hansel, formerly of the Times, now doing some consulting projects. Um, I'm, I'm interested, one of the things, Yohai, that I thought was particularly interesting was how you wove your content analysis and link analysis with the incentive structure. Right. So you have publishers who have different things they can do to get different attention, um, and you have and politicians that need attention to do their business. Um, but I, I'm interested in what you could tell about the audience side, right? How much of this is just the same distribution of people with political views and perhaps even more the same distribution of people who are interested in a situation where facts can debunk what they want to believe, right? There are people who will let themselves change their mind and people who won't and there's a distribution there, right? Is that the same, but because media has fragmented, there's a better business now in serving various niches, or is there more of an interaction? And has the attitude of the public towards fact versus opinion and what they want changed as the economics of serving them has changed? So let me be frank that I, I don't have survey data about uh, audiences and what they want or not. I'm projecting it from what they're actually doing. Uh, that said, I thought you were going somewhere else. I thought you were going with some of these cognitive psychology models that suggest that people on the right prefer certain kinds of news and prefer to be told and not to have their views challenged, which we certainly do not. Espouse. Some people, whether they're on the right or the left, I've met people both. Some people prefer that and some don't, right? But um, you're essentially, I, there are 
two parts of your question. Yeah. One is, is there a systematic difference between left and right in terms of how much people want to get their bias confirmed versus are willing to be open and get their challenge? We, our model not only doesn't require that, but to me gives a full explanation for how you could have a completely homogeneous population and yet you'd have some people uh, because their media moved first to give them confirmation bias settle into this comfortable setting and then they just don't believe the other side. You also, but you ended with a different question is do I think that things have changed generally in society about people being more questioning? Um, there is certainly a broad decline in trust in institutions generally that is associated with a congruence between, let's say, the new left's location of the individual at the moral center of concern in the 60s and 70s, the neoliberal concern for the rational actor individual in the center, both of them criticizing sources of authority through a very long-term cultural shift away from managerialism and authority and respecting people in positions of power and expertise. That's sort of a 40-year framework and it has its left versions and it has its right versions uh, and that might be a basic long-term trend I don't believe that it's what, that, that anything that applies homogeneously across the population, including changing attitudes like these, would explain this kind of asymmetric pattern. So I don't think echo chambers can explain it. I don't think filter bubble can explain it. Because essentially what we're seeing is a population that's at the same frontier, using the same technologies, the same cultural changes of greater criticism, developing vastly different practices of how exposed they are to media that's focused on facts versus media that's focused on reinforcement. Given that, you have to find some difference within either the population or the media ecosystem. We focus on the political economy of the, of the ecosystem. I, I guess the, the simple way of asking the question is, there's a, you know, there was always a group of people, the people who bought um, uh, Ron Paul's newsletters. I mean, there were always conspiracy theorists and there are conspiracy theorists on the left. I mean, there, there may be more on the right, I don't, it doesn't matter. The point was, if you only had three networks or one newspaper in a town, there was no business in serving them. So the question is, were they just unhappy customers and the only change in the world is now there's, you know, because we have more diversity, these people can get more media that they want and, and people are the same? Or did something change other than the relative pr profitability of a narrow media model? Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's um, uh, certainly a major part of it in our explanation is a profit, the, the profitability of a narrow but largish media market uh, is an important part of it. Um, then there's the question of why it didn't happen equally on the left because I'm not interested in narrow, narrow, narrow slivers. There are narrow slivers on the left, and I showed them here in the Trump rate story, that are perfectly happy to be lied to, to feel angry and outraged at the other side. That's not, there's no, it's the question of how it scales to the half the population. And that's, that's the critical thing that I'm focused on here. And that is the profitability of serving such a large population. And that's essentially what happened with Limbaugh and with Fox News. It, was, it became big business in a way that human events and the Mannion Forum and, and National Review never were. And so they only served certain classes of elites within that framework or small groups within, most people couldn't get it. I don't understand between Emily and the bar, but if you could just pass the mic back to Raju. Um, Raju Narasati, I'm on the faculty of journalism school here. I spent a lot of time thinking about business models um, and Obviously, there's been a growing concern about mainstream media and its financial health in relation to declining trust. If I'm putting together a few of your points for both of you, the, fa uh, the Fox News audience aging, uh, the idea that only about 20 or so percent live in the kind of the far right, if you will, or going far right, that bubble, and this idea that there's a right younger audience that's there and a bunch of GOP voters 
are susceptible to more fact-based journalism. If I'm hearing all this, the biggest way to kind of improve both the kind of the public square and have a viable media business is not to ask the New York Times and all these guys to get better at like reaching out to the right, but to actually have a very well-funded center-right media organization to start in this country. I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Um, you were starting to talk about it uh, uh, as well, so maybe you want to go first? Or? I, I mean, I, that, is, that is one of the things I look at. And I, I, there's a lot of very wealthy conservative funders who are funding news sites and other things, but they tend to veer more towards opinion-driven. Uh, it's been nice to see, you know, I've mentioned them this is the second time now, the Weekly Standard, funded by a very, very wealthy uh, conservative billionaire, and they've hired more reporters, and I think they're trying to occupy that space a bit. If, if I was running one of those publications, I would say we need to invest in more reality-based, reporting-driven work that, that also maintains our lens on it. And, and, you know, and bringing in that point of view, for me, that's just like another vector of the fact that newsrooms haven't represented a lot of people. And, and certain points of view are included in that, along with other elements of diversity as well. So yeah, I think, I think that would be an extremely positive thing for the universe. I mean, for you, you said, what if the Wall Street Journal took the place that Fox News had, which is, you know, arguably the Wall Street Journal is the preeminent sort of center left one right now, huh? Unless if you exclude right. the editorial page. Uh, mm. Which is more, f more f sorry, center right. Center right, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so I'll say this, yes, I think that would be good for American democracy. Yes, in theory, it should be a good, it might be a good business opportunity. Um, uh, it's hard to break into that market in the same way that it's hard to create MSNBC because that group already has alternative that it trusts and that are committed to not being inflected, like uh, the networks, or the TV networks, or um, uh, CNN. So you'd have to find people who want a conservative lean, are aware enough that Fox News is wacky and propagandist, and would be willing to switch. Um, I'd say that, that building that core audience is going to be very, very hard because Fox and talk radio have the, and, and Christian broadcasting, have the evangelicals and the white identity voters and who that sort of, I don't know what they are, small business Republicans, um, um, suburban white Republicans, who they are who would make that is not, and, and yet would be willing to jump off things they've watched all their lives is not obvious. I'm not, I, I, it would be good if such a thing could happen. I think it's a, uh, it would require a billionaire to be willing to lo lose a lot of money right, for a while. You'd have to be, and, I, and I think, frankly, I think it grows probably post-Trump when the Republican Party figures out what is after Trump, whether that's- Only if they you know, lose badly. Only if they what? Lose badly at the right. polls. And then they have to figure out, we have to rebuild from, yeah. If they do, as, as the midterms approach, if they do lose badly at the polls, and this is a question, you know, about what happened in 2016 as well, will we still be having this conversation? You know, that the, 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 the integrity of our information <coughs> environment, the integrity of the news environment, are we only talking about it because of Trump? And should we be talking about it if they lose? He was the trigger, I think. I mean, my, my biggest concern is, yes, in a, in a year from now or two years from now, nobody gives a shit about disinformation and nobody gives a shit about how platforms are uh, moderating what so many of us see. And then that creates an opportunity to go back into the cycle that we've had. So I'm, I'm hopeful, in one reason I'm hopeful is the amount of attention and the different types of people who are looking at this from different backgrounds. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm certainly worried that we get to a point, because I, I was saying this to you earlier, my feeling is uh, places like Facebook feel like they're on the path to sort of solving it. And that in a year from now, they're banking on it not being as much pressure and they can sort of get back to maintaining things. And I, so I, I, that is my big concern. And that is somewhat related to Trump, but also I think bigger than him, even though he was the trigger that got us here. So I would say he was the trigger for a ramping up in the study. 
but, but the problems are there and sustained, and uh, the U.S. is not the only place in the world. Uh, there's a dramatic drift right across both democracies and, and, and struggling or, or, or majoritarian or authoritarian countries. The, infra the research infrastructure is up. The issue is on the agenda. Uh, I don't think it's going to go away just because a couple of elections flip the other way, though the urgency it, it might go away from the public debate. I don't think it's going to go away as a question that we need to understand. Right. Terrific. Jokai, thank you very much indeed. Craig, thank you very much indeed. To everyone. Thank you both very much. If you have further questions, join us for um, a snack and a non-alcoholic beverage, which uh, I can only apologize for, but, you know, apparently uh, inviting people to drink on the university campuses is a really bad idea in America. Thank you so much. <laughs>